Hello everybody and welcome to our first in our series of View from the Riverbank Talks. My name's Sam Mason, I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Eden Rivers Trust and I'll be your host for tonight. I'd like to introduce our two special guests for this evening. I'm really, really pleased that we can welcome Lee Schofield, who's the Senior Site Manager at RSPB Horswater, to talk about the work he's been doing ahead of his book being published next Tuesday, which is really exciting. And I'd also like to welcome Michael Rogers, who is our Head of Conservation. And tonight, the theme is going to be about Wild About Fells and Rivers. We're going to be talking a little bit about some of the partnership working that we do as a trust. And then Lee, as one of our key partners, will tell, will talk to you about the work that he's been doing to help protect Eden's landscape and our rivers and the whole environment up in that area. If you have any questions for our speakers, please can you put it in the Q&A? And we will come to that once both speakers have finished their presentations. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Michael Rogers. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Michael. I'm the Head of Conservation at Eden Rivers Trust. And um, so hopefully you can all see my introductory slide. Um, I'm going to set the scene really before Lee takes us on our ramble through the fells and rivers with uh, just a bit of background on why we work in partnership with RSPB and lots of the other partners we work with and one of the reasons why. It's just a bit of a delay. There we go. So here are just some of the partners we work with. I say that because I'm sure I'll have missed someone important off, but this is just gives an example of some of the partners we work with here at Eden Rivers Trust throughout our catchment, the tributaries and the main river Eden. Some of these you'll recognize, maybe some are less familiar to you, um, but some of the examples of why we work in partnership with these organizations, the Environment Agency, for example, they're a partner in lots of different ways. Um, without their skills and expertise, a lot of our projects, such as natural flood management or river restoration, would be really difficult. It's really great to have them as partners on those projects, adding their expertise and knowledge. They also fund a lot of our work and that of other environmental charities. So they also have a role as a, as a funder. And they're also a statutory organization that um, consents of the work we do. For example, if we're working in a river channel or nearby. So the Environment Agency is an example of a partner with lots of different hats, as is Natural England. Um, without the help of some of their staff on their knowledge of ecosystems and natural habitats, some of our projects just simply wouldn't get off the ground. But equally, they fund some of our projects, like our Troutbeck Water Environment Grant project is um, funded and overseen through, through Natural England. So they have various roles as well. And then we've got partners like Cumbria Wildlife Trust, the National Trust, and of course, our other Cumbrian-based Rivers Trusts who work with us um, and across catchment to make sure we're making the best space for nature. And RSPB are a key partner in our role, and I'll touch more on that as I go on. So those are some of the partners and some of the roles they have. But why do we work together? Well, there's lots of reasons, and I've only got 10 minutes, so I chose to pick one reason, and that's landscape scale conservation. Um, the wildlife that we work with in the Eden Valley isn't constrained or doesn't recognize some of the same boundaries we do. So it's important we work together to make that catchment and that corridor that is the Eden River more joined up for wildlife and make the habitats more connected. So I've chosen to use this very simple diagram, which I love from um, a white paper uh, led by Sir John Lawton um, called Making Space for Nature, which outlined some key principles around landscape scale conservation and what it means. So I will come on to an example of this in a moment and in particular how we're using these principles with RSPB and some of our other partners. But you'll see what this shows is the idea of core areas, stepping stones, buffer zones. What does all that mean? Well, I like to think of the core areas as that kind of key site for wildlife conservation. You may think of it as maybe a nature reserve. So 
Wild Holes Water might be a good example. So where the organization doing the conservation owns that land and can make decisions over how you look after the habitat and the wildlife that it supports. Then you've got your stepping stone corridors, maybe like a local nature reserve or an area where someone's giving across some farmland to nature conservation. And that's key for wildlife that can only travel small distances. They need to be able to step across that landscape. And then you have your corridors. So it could be as simple as a hedgerow, or it could be a longer corridor, like a, a network or um, connected habitat, such as a railway. And key to all this is your kind of area of influence to make sure that the sustainable use and wildlife, the, the, the area around those areas is permeable for wildlife. So some of those examples I've chosen to use here would be, I've mentioned a nature reserve, such as wild Horswater as a core area. Another example might be a Cumbria Wildlife Trust nature reserve, like High Court Hill, managed for wildlife and its habitats. A sustainable use area I've chosen to use are the Leith Farm Cluster Group. So where we work with farmers that have neighboring land to discuss how they can manage their soil better to make sure that um, fertilizers aren't running off into a watercourse or that they're storing as much carbon as they can in their soil. So that's a sustainable use area. Then you've got a landscape corridor. I've chosen to use the example of the South Carlisle Railway here, a, a connected ha um, potential habitat right across our landscape. And of course, we have our rivers, but I'll come on to that in a moment. So how does this work in practice? So I've used an example here of an OS map um, with Horswater Reservoir in the south here, running up to Ascombe in the north. And our core areas here are Nadal Farm Nature Reserve, um, which is owned by United Utilities, but managed by RSPB. And they have that management um, control over that area. And the in-house farms that are managed by uh, Lowther Estate. Of course, we have the rivers Lowther, the Swindle Beck, the River Leith running through these areas, and they provide natural corridors for wildlife to move within this landscape. And then we have highlighted in red some of the other networks so long linear transport networks managed by national highways, formerly Highways England along here, and also Network Rail, um, who managed the West Coast Main Line. So those are opportunities to manage the landscape in a different way. And then looking at that more permeable, sustainable use area, we've got a huge amount of influence over this area through our farming cluster group. So it starts to put those ideas into practice and how working in partnership across a landscape this, like this can create wildlife corridors. So an example of a restoration area within here. This is um, Swindlebeck, which I know Lee will come on to in more detail. But just across the catchment, you have RSPB Horswater. So already by conserving wildlife and creating habitats in this area, you're buffering that zone and you're creating and restoring more habitat um, next door to an existing nature reserve. So you're buffering it and you're making it bigger and you're making it better for wildlife. In this example, which Lee will come on to, RSPB took a formerly straightened channel and worked with partners like ourselves, the Lake District National Park, Natural England, United Utilities of the landowner and the Environment Agency and many more to take this formerly straightened channel and put meanders back creating fantastic range of different habitats for fish, for small mammals, for invertebrates, and also protecting all the while these fantastic hay meadows in the middle. So that's an example of how you can restore habitat right next to a core area to create a more connected landscape. So an example of a, that's a completed project, an example of a current partnership project on a landscape scale that's just really setting up is our waterfall reintroduction project. So waterfalls are one of our fastest declining small mammals in the UK. Um, they've reduced in catastrophic amount since the 1980s, as much as 90%. And they're really scarce now in Cumbria. Um, we have a few isolated populations up in the, on the Pennine Becks. Um, and we would love to see them back in the Lowther Valley where the bank sides are littered with their former burrows. But the only way we can do that is to work in partnership. 
And these um, little voles here are ones that were reintroduced into Kilda Forest in, over the last five years. And we would love to do something similar, working with partners in the Eden Valley to do the same in Lauda. So how does that fit with my kind of idea of that landscape scale conservation that I've, I've mentioned? So this goes back to our diagram of the Lauda Valley. It's looking a bit messy now, so I'll remove that. Well, we've currently got an ecologist called Derek Gao doing a reintroduction plan for us. And if we get the correct conditions, then these are our core areas where water bowls will possibly be reintroduced in the future. There's lots of criteria that has to be met before they can, but we need core areas where the habitat is correct and the conditions are met for them to be released. But it wouldn't be any good if we released waterfalls back into these areas, which are um, Nardle Farm, Swindle Beck, as I've just shown you. And then down here is one of Lava Park's in-house farms called Setera Park. And if the river in between, the Lava Valley, wasn't managed in the correct way, then it would be a bit of a forlorn hope kind of putting those waterfalls back in because they just simply wouldn't be able to spread out and survive. Um, it would be a failed reintroduction. So working on that landscape scale, with all those different partners I've mentioned is critically important to the success of a project like this. And we've already started. So we've um, started working with Derek Gao, who breeds water bulls, and the Restoring Ratty project that reintroduced them to kill the forest in Northumberland. Um, and they're continuing their breeding program of water bulls found in northern populations. So they're um, potentially going to do better if they ever get reduced, um, reintroduced back into Cumbria. We're engaging with those local landowners as part of our Lauda farmer group. And we're creating and restoring habitats across the landscape. You find this with habitats that water voles like, slow moving, relatively deep water, lush bankside vegetation, that a lot of their habitat requirements are great for the river for lots of different reasons. But that's only possible in partnership. So projects like this just simply wouldn't even get started if we couldn't work together across that whole landscape. But there are other examples where we're not working with RSPB in particular, but we might be working with, for example, the Lake District National Park at Grisdale. We've just completed a river restoration project in Grisdale, this top photo, where if you want to go along on the, the walk up from Patterdale towards Helvellyn, You'll find these um, boards where you can take photos of our river restoration project where the river has been forced out into the floodplain to take a new, more natural route. And we've been working the bottom left photo there is our Kenbeck restoration project in what's called the Fellfoot Forward Landscape Partnership Area, which is uh, part of the North Pennines AOMB. And we're working there with lots of landowners in the fell side to renaturalize rivers and create more habitat for wildlife. And all those partners I mentioned at the start are involved in some way or another in most of these projects. Um, the one in the bottom right hand corner, uh, Woods for Water, is a new partnership project that's just started where we're working with landowners to plant woodland in um, areas, the riparian zone around rivers to create shelter and shade for the river and the species that it supports. And that's a partnership with all sorts of new partners, such as um, the Beaver Trust, Forestry Commission, um, Woodland Trust, um, are all involved in that one, along with Rivers Trusts all over the country. So you start to see why partnerships are so important to some of the work we do. So before I hand over to Lee to go into more detail on RSPB's work in Wild Horsewater, um, what are some of the exciting partnership projects coming up for us in the Eden catchment? Well, um, working with RSPB, United Utilities, Natural England, um, and the RSPB, we're looking at landscape scale recovery um, through a program called the Endangered Landscapes Program. So that's really exciting for us and would cover a huge area that not only crosses the Eden catchment, but would also go into the River Loon catchment across um, the, the catchment there. We're, I've touched on bringing water voles back to the Lauda Valley, something I'm really excited about. And we'd hope that if we get the right conditions, we could start doing that next year or the year after. And we're making all these um, movements at the moment to create the right conditions. 
Um, we're looking at a new pharma group in the uh, Pennine Fell side around Croglin and, and Rennick, building on the success of our partnership project with the North Pennines AOMB. And that's really exciting. And our river restoration uh, program with the Environment Agency, um, we're prioritizing that in these areas where we have lots of momentum, because then hopefully we can bring it all together in fantastic new partnership projects in the future. So that's a whistle stop tour through some of the projects we're doing together. Um, and I thought that was a nice way to introduce Lee, who's someone that works with us very closely. Um, in the time I've been here, um, he's been a great support to the work that Ian Rivers Trust have done. Um, and I'll hand over to Lee now and let him take us through the wild fells and rivers of Horswater. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Brilliant introduction, much appreciated. Um, I'll just share my screen on here. Okay, hopefully you can all see that okay. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for uh, inviting me to, to, to come and talk this evening. So um, yeah, I'm Lee Schofield, I'm Senior Site Manager at RSPB Horsewater. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm very excited that um, I've written this book all about the experiences that I've had at Horsewater over the course of the last nine years, uh, which is going to be published on Thursday next week. So um, the talk is going to be about the work that we're doing um, and the reasons that I felt it was worth kind of turning into a book um, and about some of the changes that we're that we're making at Horsewater and, and where we hope to get to in a few decades time with them. So I want to start the talk with a view. Um, so this is the southwest corner of Riggendale and standing in this spot gives me gives me a really commanding view of much of the land that I'm helping to look after for the RSPB. Looking at it from a spot like this makes me feel a whole medley of different things. I, I certainly share the, the awe that the millions of people who visit the Lake District every year feel on seeing the landscape and its raw dramatic beauty. And I count myself incredibly lucky being able to call this effectively my office. I feel the weight of responsibility too, um, knowing that the decisions that my, my team and I take here will influence how wildlife fares both now and into the future. But it's also a view that makes me a bit sad for over the course of the years that I've been working at Horsewater, I've come to realize that this, like many other parts of the Lake District, is a landscape full of holes. Had I stood in the same spot a decade ago, there was a pretty good chance that I might have caught a glimpse of England's last eagle. After an absence of 170 years from the Lake District, a pair of eagles returned to breed in Riggendale, which opens its mouth onto the southwestern shore of Horswater Reservoir in 1970. They remained at Horswater under the watchful care of the RSPB until 2015, a couple of years after I started in the job as site manager at Horswater, when the last male, who'd been on his own since the last female died 10 years before him, disappeared. He was probably about 20 years old, which is a pretty good age for a wild eagle. And as he passed away, England became eagleless once again, which is a which is a pretty damning statistic that the whole of our ravaged countryside, the whole of England was incapable of even supporting a single one of their kind. But eagles are certainly not the only thing that's missing from the Lake District's cast of creatures. Once you start to look, it becomes apparent that the Lake District is a landscape of ghosts effectively. This fairly spooky looking ruin is called High Loop, directly across the water from Riggendale. Loop comes from lupine, referring to wolves, a species that the people of the Lake District lived alongside until the 1300s. It's pretty likely because of its design, the fact it's got more than one room, um, that this cottage was used by people to live in, most likely used by shepherds living up on the fell to guard their flocks from our erstwhile top predator. These protective shepherding techniques, they've changed over time. And what we've got left is, is an echo of what there was previously. And, and so it would be quite easy to argue that it is wolves, probably more so than any other creature that have shaped the farming practices of the Lake District. 
There's several wolf crags and there's lots of eagle crags dotted around the Lake District. And the place abounds with, with place names commemorating other species too. So black grouse, pine martins, wild boar, red kites and wildcats. They've all got place names named after them. And these are all species that we've either we've either intentionally exterminated or changed the land so much that it's become inhospitable to them. Black grouse vanished from the lakes within my lifetime, and I'm not really all that old, finally succumbing to the slow and steady chipping away at the mosaic of woodland, bog and grassland that they relied on to survive. The signs of what we've lost are all around us. So beds of bracken highlight the places where woodlands once grew. Lines of ditches show where bogs have been drained. A straight row of gnarled hawthorns are the ghosts of old hedgerows. Curving depressions in the floodplain show the meandering courses of old rivers. These signs left on maps um, and the ones that are left in the land can act as a guide for how to repair some of the damage. This small tarn up on Mardell Common above Horswater was visible on the maps until around 1950, but then likely thanks to post-war financial incentives designed to improve land for agriculture, it vanished. When I started at Horswater, it was little more than a little more than a puddle really. A few years ago, by blocking the drain that flowed out of the end of it, the tarn has come back to life. Teal and reed buntings were quick to find it, and the emerging bog bean and other wildflowers are now busy with dragonflies and other insects during the summer months. So not everything was lost, of course. So when we took over the two hill farms of Nadal and Swindell 10 years ago, we had several fragments of habitats that used to be much more widespread that we could work with and, and nurture and try to spread out. The rich ancient woodland of Nadal Forest closed the eastern slope to the reservoir, but the western shore, which is a sheep graze common, looks very different. We had patches of heathy juniper scrub, which had benefited from long periods without grazing, but they were generally fairly small and quite isolated from each other. The most surprising habitat fragments um, were those found on some of our crags, particularly those ones that had some kind of um, calcareous limestone influence. Beyond the reach of the sheep and the deer, spectacular botanical diversity had hung on for, for deer life, really. These are essentially our alpine meadows and they're rich in, in tasty nectar rich flowers like rose root, angelica, harebells and devil's bit scabious. Most of these species though don't particularly want to be growing on such inaccessible terrain, but in a landscape which is almost universally grazed, it's pretty much the only place that they stand a chance. Farming traditions cling on too, but also in a similarly fragile state. Distorted by the post-war incentives to intensify production in a landscape that couldn't really be much less well suited to it, farming in the Lake District is a shadow of what it used to be. A patchwork of small farms rearing cattle, goats, pigs, sheep and geese, as well as growing root crops, apples and damsons, morphed into what became effectively gigantic sheep factories. With the aid of tractors, fertilisers, steel frame buildings and concentrated feedstuffs, the land's natural carrying capacity was smashed and wildlife bled from the landscape. Hay meadows were converted to silent silage fields, hedges grubbed out, drainage installed and the wet and weedy parts of the landscape were tidied away. At Horswater, thanks to the RSPB's partnership with the United Utilities who, who own the land that we rent from them, we've been given a chance to try to turn things around. Across about 3,000 hectares of farm and common land, we're working with a whole range of other partners, including Eden Rivers Trust, to breathe as much life back into the land as we can. While this might sound like good news to you, not everyone was thrilled by us taking on our farm tenancies at Horswater. And the first few years of my job as site manager were characterised by conflict. I guess it was perhaps predictable that some farmers might have had reservations about a big charity entering the, the local farming scene, and some might have had justifiable concerns about how our management of the land might impact upon them. But the opposition came from other more surprising quarters too. And I just want to read you a section from the book, which was, which describes an episode, which, which was one of the kind of main inspirations for me to, to, to start writing it. The Lake District, with its constantly evolving farms and an ecosystem full of holes, became a World Heritage Site in 2017. The nomination document that describes the English Lake District World Heritage Site runs to 716 pages. 
So it's difficult to summarize what the designation really stands for. It talks a lot about beauty, about farming and sheep, especially Herdwick sheep, the Lake District's native breed beloved of Beatrix Potter. It mentions nature now and again and talks about the Lake District as the birthplace of the conservation movement, though it means landscape conservation, which focuses on preserving the aesthetics of a place rather than nature conservation, which is more concerned with the protection of species and habitats. It celebrates the area's geology and pretty lakeshore villas, its poets and farmers. If you look hard enough, you can find sections in the document that support or oppose almost every possible point of view, but the emphasis on sheep farming is clear. The word sheep appears 365 times, the word flower only three times, farm appears 1052 times, nature 92 times. I'm sure that there are lots of people who care passionately about the designation, but I've not met many of them. Most of the farmers I know are ambivalent. Contrary to what you might expect, World Heritage status doesn't provide them with either funds or protection. The Federation of Cumbria Commoners initially welcomed the designation, having described it as a powerful weapon that puts hill farming centre stage, but it's not clear how that weapon is to be used. A couple of years after the inscription, a delegation from the Lake District World Heritage Site Steering Group came to Naddle Farm to give my RSPB colleagues and me a training session designed to help us understand what being in a World Heritage Site meant for our conservation work at Horswater and elsewhere in the lakes. They talked us through the cultural concepts from the nomination document and the new paperwork we now had to complete to enable the steering group to ensure our activities didn't impact on the World Heritage Site's attributes. In the discussion afterwards, I asked how the RSPB's presence at Horswater was perceived from a World Heritage perspective. I was told that when the application was being prepared for UNESCO, the steering group had been forced to accept that there were a number of warts on the face of the potential World Heritage Site. One of these warts was the RSPB's presence at Horswater. For my and my colleagues' work to have been described like this was extraordinarily offensive, and the fact that anyone would be prepared to say something so blunt to our faces took my breath away. I asked for clarification, just to make sure I'd heard correctly. It was explained to us that we weren't authentic. Because we didn't fit the stereotypical profile of family farmers, we were considered second-class citizens. They were effectively saying that the only true stewards of the land in this newly minted World Heritage Site were the Lake District farmers, ideally born and bred here and from farming families, lineages to which my colleagues and I didn't belong. Yet they also worried about the lack of new entrants to farming. It's hard to see how this sort of thinking can end well. So I don't know about you, but I often find myself in the moments after an argument or disagreement thinking of the, the things that I wish I could have said at the time. And it was partly my anger following what I've come to think of as wart gate that started me writing the book. I didn't think it was gonna be a book at first um, and the lines I began composing were initially sort of shouty and cathartic, but I was trying to write the things that I might want to say if I was ever challenged in a similar way again. Slowly but surely though, I began to realize that perhaps there was an interesting story that was worth telling. Alongside descriptions of the ecological restoration work that we're doing at Horswater, my book also tells a personal story. I wanted people to understand that conservationists like me are every bit as committed, passionate and connected to the places that we're looking after as anybody. I know my story isn't unique. Many people working in nature conservation, perhaps some of you in the room this evening, have had just as many bruising encounters as I have. And my hope is that my book will resonate with others in the conservation community, as well as more widely, of course. So the story of the ecological, the ecological story that, that I tell in the book is, is one of, of, of change. It's one of changing the landscape to deliver the needs of society. In the face of the joint climate and wildlife emergencies that we're currently facing down, our work at Horswater feels like much more than something that's nice to do. It feels, it feels essential, it feels like our duty. Like many upland landscapes, much of the Lake District is not in good ecological shape. The impacts of our management of it as a species, particularly over the course of the last 70 years, has reduced the land's ability to slow the flow of water, to lock up carbon and to provide a home for wildlife. Our job at Horswater, my job at Horswater, along with the rest of my team and all the partners that we work with is to try to turn this around and then to try to inspire others to do the same. 
this image, these are, we've just had a series of, of visualizations um, completed. And this one shows the fragmented landscape that we started with a decade ago. My book describes how it ended up in the poor state we found it in, what we've done so far to set it on the road to recovery, and what it might look like once that recovery has had time to run. Change happens slowly in the uplands, but here's how we hope our land will look in a few decades from now. It's still the recognizably same rugged Lake District Vista, but as the work that we're doing now comes to fruition, it will become a landscape with more color, structure and substance, where habitats blur into one another. Some of this transformation is already underway. The beck running through Swindale had been canalized a couple of hundred years ago, and the hay meadows either side had suffered due to, their, due to the heavy grazing pressure. Many of the bogs on the higher ground had been drained, work that was supported through post-war financial agricultural improvement grants, the same ones that funded the drainage of the small tarn on Mardell Common that I mentioned earlier. By blocking up the drains in the bog and bringing the water up to the surface again, the carbon store in the peatland soil is protected and special wetland wildlife is returning. The restoration of the Beck in Swindale is, is probably the biggest success that we've had to date, certainly the most enjoyable project that I've been involved with since I've been working in conservation. Eden Rivers Trust were involved early on helping to plan the work that was needed. Rivers are a pretty big focus of the book for me, um, pretty, pretty big focus of my book. Um, and I describe how by returning the Anders to the Beck and, and changing how we looked after the meadows, Swindale now provides a home for far more wildlife than it used to, including salmon, which returned to spawn in the restored river pretty much immediately that the work was completed. I just want to read you another section of the book, um, just another couple of pages, which um, highlights some of the very real challenges that are associated with river restoration that anybody, anybody working for a Rivers Trust will, will probably find, um, find quite familiar. Um, so the section I'm going to read describes what happened um, just after we made the final connection of the river into the newly dug meandering course that we made for it. Watching the water enter the new channel for the first time was exhilarating. As soon as it passed, gravels buried for centuries started to shine on the new riverbed as they were cleaned by the flow. As the problematic downstream end of the restored route started to fill, we were reassured that widening it had been a good move. The water flowed lazily through it without picking up the silt as it passed. For those of us who had laboured over the past months, losing sleep thinking of solutions to all manner of unanticipated obstacles, this was a momentous and moving moment. Conditions were now set for nature to start to shape the river by herself, returning the detail and complexity that had been robbed by human straightening. We went home for the day, pleased with our work and looking forward to the final stages of the job that were to follow. I woke on Saturday to heavy rain. As the morning progressed, it got heavier and then heavier still. I knew that if it was raining this much at home, I could count on it being even worse in Swindale. The more it rained, the more I panicked. Just as I was about to head over to see what was happening, the phone rang. George, the project's main geomorphologist, as worried as I was, had already visited the site and his report wasn't good. The beck had already burst its banks and the flood was rising towards the area where we had piled the soil that had been dug to create the new channel. I rang up our contractor, thinking that we might be able to do some emergency work, perhaps by, by creating an earth bund around the pile. We arrived at about the same time, diverting our vehicles around flooded roads and battling the strengthening wind. As we drove up to the site, the beck where it ran alongside Swindale Lane was like I'd never seen it before. A colossal raging torrent was crashing way over the top of the footbridge downstream of our work area and was beginning to cover the road. Compared to this, the storm that blew down my tents, my tents two summers before was just a squall. When we reached the restoration site, there was no sign of our new channel, or the old one for that matter, or the meadows either side. The whole floodplain was entirely submerged. Diggers stood like islands surrounded by water, Getting to them would have been a challenge, let alone operating them in such a depth. Water was already lapping at the bottom of the soil pile. It was clear that nothing could be done. Concerned that if we spent much more time in the valley, we might be cut off and not be able to get home again, we resigned ourselves to the fact that nature had won this episode. We just have to wait until the water receded to see what the impact would be. The rain kept up and was still falling on Sunday morning, and I knew there wouldn't be much to see on site. I was unsettled and snappish all day, 
It was hard to see how this could mean anything but disaster for the Beck and humiliation for me. By evening, the storm started to abate, but I knew it would be hours before the water level dropped. I went to bed restless, plagued with nightmares of what I might find the next day. I woke at dawn and headed straight for Swindale. My colleague Bill and John from United Utilities, who had invested as much time and energy on this project as I had, obviously had the same idea. And so we walked over together to survey what we could only imagine would be carnage. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Aside from a strand line of vegetation indicating the level of the weekend's flood and a few bits of timber and other debris in some strange places, there was no sign that the valley had been underwater just a few hours earlier. The sun shone. It was a perfect summer's day. As we approached the downstream end of the restored section of the beck, which had been a silty hole in the ground two days earlier, we were greeted by a scene that took our breath away. The August sun shone through a crystal clear channel of water flowing over shining, pristine gravel. A 30 metre long bar ran alongside the flow, several inches proud of the water. The silt that had caused us such headache over the past weeks was nowhere to be seen. Carried down from upstream by the surging flow, thousands of tonnes of gravel had been on the move over the course of the weekend storm and the river had deposited it all exactly where it wanted it, creating riffles, bars, pools and shallows, and a river through which water moved far more slowly. It was as if a switch labelled natural processes had been flicked. Nature was now back in charge. John, Bill and I wandered around on the new gravel stream bed, which had not, was not yet fully formed and still slightly spongy, completely dumbstruck. We had over 50 years of nature conservation experience between us, but we had never seen anything like this before. Our relief was immense and we cavorted around on the gravel, sinking our fingers into its newly minted surface. I drank the cool water from my cupped hands, the first to taste the crisp flavour of our reborn river. It was genuinely the most exciting project I've ever been involved with, the most exciting moment to see how, when given the space, given the time, nature can just, just sort herself out if we, if we allow her to do so. And we're seeing similar things happen in other parts of the site. So, you know, the direct interventions that we've made, the, the managed um, realignment of the Beck, if you like, as well as the, the sort of the change to the management of the hay meadows and the blocking up of the drains in the bogs, alongside tree and scrub planting, they're all having an impact. But it's grazing that makes the biggest mark on our land and changing grazing is key to, to unlocking the potential for recovery across a huge, a huge swathe of the land that we're looking after. By cutting back on our sheep numbers, using hardy cattle and ponies, and in some places stopping grazing altogether, our habitats are changing in response. At Mardell Head, wildflowers, ferns and trees, which were previously imprisoned on the crags, are spilling back out into the landscape again. It is the plant life that underpins the health of the whole ecosystem, providing seeds and berries for birds and small mammals to eat, nectar for pollinators, as well as colour and beauty to us. This is another big focus of my book, and I believe we should all be paying more attention to flowers and managing more land to help them to thrive. To restore nature, we need to employ all the help that we can get. A growing body of evidence is showing that pine martins can help to protect red squirrels, which currently thrive at Horsewater. Pine martins are on the increase, and the prospects of, helping, of them helping to keep grey squirrels under control is one that we should all be welcoming. I think we can look forward to beavers lending more of a hand too. Whether by natural spread or by reintroduction, it's pretty likely that Horsewater will provide a home for beavers at some point in the future. Their dams will act as natural filters for water, help to slow the flow and provide a massive boost for a huge host of other wetland wildlife. Although the focus is on nature, people are central to all of these endeavours. There's now 10 full-time staff employed at Horsewater, double the number that were working here before we took over. As well as looking after the livestock, cutting the hay and repairing walls and fences, there are new opportunities at Horsewater now too. My colleagues run ecotourism initiatives, carry out research and monitoring, manage our nursery and plant the resulting trees and wildflowers back out into the landscape. We bring in grants to spend on local contractors and suppliers, and we all contribute to the local community and economy as much as anybody else does. We may not fit the mould of authentic farmers, but then farming has always moved with the times. 
Over the course of the last few years, I've been fortunate enough to have travelled to places that are in many ways comparable to Horswater, and I describe those trips in the book. On them, I experienced firsthand how much richer our uplands could be if we changed the way that we look after them. In southwest Norway, where hills and mountains are grazed at a much lower intensity than is typical here at home, though with all the same cultural pride, the sheep wander through flower-rich pastures and bogs, swathes of montane scrub and high-altitude woods and heaths. The rivers run crystal clear and eagles soar overhead. There is no ecological reason that our uplands couldn't look the same if we wanted them to. But I'm not so naive to think that that is what everybody wants. As I've spent more time with farmers and other land managers in the lakes, I've realised that finding ways for different approaches to coexist is perhaps our biggest challenge. With careful planning and a degree of compromise on all sides, there's no reason that we can't have land being managed purely for nature, sitting alongside productive farmland. Pitching rewilding against farming helps nobody. There is plenty of middle ground. I've tried to describe both the challenges and the opportunities that exist in this messy middle ground in my book. We can have farming and rewilding if we want it, but only if we stop shouting at each other. So Wildfell is a story of a work in progress, but my hope is that if we do our jobs properly at Horswater, one day we'll have a landscape that's fit for eagles again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lee. That was brilliant and beautiful illustrations. And it's fascinating to see how much the landscapes is changing there in the Horswater area with the work that you've done. It's beautiful to see. Um, so after all that, I'm just sort of getting over the pictures of the eagles, actually. Um, if anybody would like to ask any questions to our panelists, please, can you put it in the Q&A now? It's, it's looking a little empty at the moment, so it would be great if some people could put some questions in there. But in the meantime, I've got a question for Lee. So, Lee, what's next for Horswater? Uh, so the Endangered Landscapes, landscapes? landscapes programme that Michael mentioned, um, the deadline for that application is tomorrow. Um, so if we're successful that bid, that'll be, that'll be a really, really big boost for the local area. So it's going to involve a whole, a whole range of, of um, direct interventions. Um, you know, there's opportunities for more river restoration, we hope, more tree planting, more habitat restoration on those core sites that Michael referred to. And this, this all the allow the directly managed land as, as, as well as our land at Horswater. Um, but it's got a really big focus on supporting farmers in that wider landscape, in that sustainable use area, if you like, to, um, to, to help them with that transition to, um, you know, the, the future funding model for farming um, in the UK, which is all about public money for public goods. So making the transition from a you know very heavily production focused model which is where most people are at the moment to one which embraces the delivery of uh you know carbon sequestration and flood risk reduction and all those other things that we know land can and, and really must provide is a big leap so so putting in the advice and the support um is is, is a major focus of that project so so we're going to be keeping our fingers crossed and, and hoping um hoping that we're uh, we're successful in that application Will that help with this messy middle ground that you talk about of how you actually can coexist together and, and help farmers to be able to embrace sort of nature and the natural capital assets that they've got on their farms? Absolutely. That's that's the whole focus of it, really. It's um, it's about getting people kind of working together, trying to trying to work through this sort of false polarity between farming versus nature. Um, and yeah, the, you know, the, we, we've been we've been developing this project for for probably 18 months or so we had some development funding um and you know i've had lots of really positive positive conversations with farmers in the local area there's a, a cluster group out at Orton that are you know thinking really progressively about how they can how they can make their farm businesses more resilient in the face of a changing a changing climate um and you know i think getting those messages out there the, the more people that are doing this stuff the more socially accept, acceptable it becomes. And of course, there's always gonna be people that resist this kind of stuff as well. And I think recognizing that diversity within the farming community that you know there are some people that, that, that want to change and there are some people that don't is, is, is a pretty important first step really. I'd agree with that, definitely. Um, we've got a comment here from Pete from the Woodland Trust. Hello, Pete, nice to see you here. Uh, saying excellent talk and no doubt an excellent book. I love your point about flowers driving the landscape and its restoration. 
We've created a few new woods in Cumbria and beyond using flower rich mixes in the ground preparation as a woodland precursor, those sites where we use this methodology are far, far more biodiverse, far quicker than standard plantings. Let's use more flowers. So I think you've got a bit of a fan there on using flowers. <laughs> Pete's in the book, so he's got to say nice things, really. <laughs> I think one of the things that um, it's easy to forget is that trees are effectively flowers too. You know, they're flowering plants and the number of the number of flowers produced on a hawthorn or a crab apple, you know, it's, it's, it's like a whole meadow by itself, really. Um, and, you know, the, the, with having, getting more trees into the landscape um, of a diverse range of species provides um, nectar for 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 pretty much the entire year, you know, ending ending sort of at the very end with ivy, but beginning with some of those kind of really early um, sort of blackthorn, hawthorn species. There's 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 something flowering all the year round when you look to our trees. Have you, which flowers have you had particular successes with reintroducing or or being able to make more widespread in the area? So some things re respond really quickly. So devil's bit scabious. Um, so where we've had quite areas of really quite coarse rank grassland, really species poor, by changing the grazing away from sort of sheep only and, and utilizing fell ponies. Um, some of those areas have just exploded with devil's bit scabious and, and heath spotted orchids. Um, and we're looking at the possibility of a marsh fritillary butterfly translocation. And devil's bit scabious is the food plant for that butterfly. Um, and at the, the top end of Swindale now, there is so much devil's bit scabious. And 10 years ago, it was there. You know, it was in the old damp field corner here and there. Um, so often, you know, you don't really need to do much other than just just change the grazing. And the seed source is there already. And these plants can bounce back really quickly. They, they particularly fast, I think, in, you know, wet, wet ground species. So um, bog asphodel as well because the water helps to move this, the, the seeds around. Bog asphodel has bounced back really fast again in response to grazing. So um, yeah, there's some species that it's really, really very straightforward and others that you probably do need to intervene. Those species like pyramidal bugle, which um, you know only has a single location in the whole of England, um, you know that's not gonna spread by itself. That needs more of an interventionist approach and, and collecting seed and growing them on and planting them out. So, so yeah, it's understanding the sort of the, the starting point for a lot of these species and, and then working out what needs to be done for them. That's great. Thanks for that. OK, I've got a question here about eagles. Is it possible to attract eagles back to horse water in the same way that ospreys are drawn to Bassenthwaite and Falshaw? Um, so I think one of the key interventions with ospreys was providing nesting platforms for them, which was something that was missing. Um, so I think you know, the, the likelihood of eagles returning to horse water, you know, England generally, the Lake District generally, is probably better now than it's almost ever been. So the um, the South of Scotland Golden Eagle reintroduction project. Um, there's currently about 30 birds that have been translocated that are now drifting around in the Scottish borders. And that's more than there were um, before they recolonized. Um, you know, I say recolonized the, before the pair came back to the Lake District again in 1969. So, um, you know, if we can make the habitat suitable for them, if we can make the landscape produce lots of wild prey, if we can get more heather on the hills, which will attract more grouse, that will, yeah, there's a, there's a per perfectly good chance that, that golden eagles will return. Um, there's also the, the fairly realistic prospect that white-tailed eagles will also come back. So um, the, the growing population of the, 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 the reintroduced population in Scotland, as well as the smaller one on the Isle of Wight, you know, the birds that have been released there are now roaming around the country all over the place. So we've had visits, two visits from Isle of Wight satellite tag birds um, at Horswater already. Um, and they used they also used to breed at Horsewater up until about 200 years ago, as well as, you know, pretty widely in the Lake District. Actually, they were it's believed they used to be 10 times as many white tailed eagles as golden eagles. Um, and they are much less bothered by people. So in the very busy Lake District, um, you know, it might actually be that white tailed eagles are, are more at home than, than golden eagles are, which which do tend to avoid kind of people wherever they possibly can. That's interesting to talk about white-tailed eagles like that. And in fact, that takes me on to my next question from Lindsay, who says, has thought been given to controlling visitor numbers so they don't damage what you are creating? Because obviously that is a big issue in the Lake Districts, as we all know. So it's pretty much impossible to limit visitor numbers. Um, I, it's, this is a really thorny issue that I think the Lake District is really going to have to grapple with. Um, you know, we're, we're quite we're quite lucky in that Horswater is off the beaten track. You know, there isn't the infrastructure, there aren't the car parks, 
there isn't the road network to 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 support really any more people than we've than, than visit already um you know we have seen some kind of visitor problems you know following following the first um lockdown when that was released we had you know our fair share of of um dodgy camping and trees being chopped down and all that kind of stuff but you know compared with the honeypot areas of the lakes we we, we get off incredibly lightly but you know the, the the trend is increasing for more and more people and i think what we really need to focus on is making the whole of the countryside as appealing and as accessible as the lake district currently is you know having these sort of visitor um honeypots these 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 national parks which have lots of sort of marketing campaigns put behind them to attract people you know there are just as many beautiful places outside of the lake district you know the pennines lots of other parts of the, the countryside that, that that really need their access to be improved as well and then we can sort of spread that visitor pressure out much more widely i think we'd agree with that definitely um because i mean although the eden is beautiful it is still a bit of a hidden gem but there is that balance between it's um turning into a honeypot all, all on its own and making sure yeah. that we can protect the landscapes it's 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 a tricky balance it really is but i think education is a big part of that as well so sort of helping people to understand how to use the countryside safely and and limit the damage that they can do there it's the whole sort of sustainable tourism side of it i guess yeah yeah i mean i i don't know about you but i you know i remember very clearly the the sort of the countryside code you know there were there were campaigns there were signs whatever you know take your rubbish home with you close the gates after you all that kind of stuff and those very basic messages just they've been they've kind of fallen by the wayside a bit so i think there's quite a lot the government could do to to improve the situation definitely okay i've got a question here from andrew saying have you lost your badges as, as a result of local badger calls quite a specific question that one <laughs> Uh, no, we haven't. There's lots of badgers at Horsewater. The, the badger cull is in our part of the world, but it doesn't happen on our land. It has to have, um, you know, um, farming tenants approval for that, that to happen. And obviously we didn't approve that because we don't approve of, you know, as an organisation, the, the, the science the science just isn't there that badger culls are effective. So, uh, no, there's still lots of badgers at Horsewater. We have a, um, a very popular badger hide, actually, that can be booked for, for people to come and get kind of nice close views of them which is which is really popular and sort of part of that's part of our ecotourism um which is which is, it's been really interesting actually opening that badger hide just how popular it's been um and it shows the appetite that's out there for for um you know engaging with nature in the national park and how few other opportunities there are to do it so that's going to be part of our elp program as well is offering bits of advice you know what small scale initiatives can people set up that can generate a bit of income to to support their their farm businesses Brilliant. That's great. Right. I've got a question for both of you now, because um, as organisations who work a lot in partnership with a, a lot of different and diverse organisations, how do you balance your objectives with those of some of your other partners? Because you could be working with other NGOs, other charities, government agencies, commercial businesses. How do you make it work? Um we just the RSPB are always right. That's the, uh, the golden rule, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, it's difficult. Partnership working is really difficult, and you just have to. It's just all through dialogue, isn't it? And and finding that kind of comfortable middle ground, and accepting that sometimes there may be things you disagree on, and and then you know not necessarily going forward with the project if it if it relies on finding a, a consensus. So, I think it's about establishing kind of really good, positive working relationships, friendly relationships. So so Pete on the call there with the Woodland Trust is is just brilliant at kind of like getting into every partnership going um and you know i consider he's 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 a friend as well as a colleague michael and i have a great working relationship um you know there's a whole bunch of us that are in um you know doing very similar jobs we've got a lot in common and you know i think when you when you become kind of friends with people as well as colleagues um things start to get an awful lot easier really i think having um good communication is really key so to make a partnership work you need to know what each organization's mission is, who can take forward which parts. Um, since I moved back to the area, um, we our strength is working with the landowners in the Lauda Valley who are part of our facilitation group. And the strengths that RSPB have are working on their kind of tenant land with um, United Utilities to make sure that we can fill in the gaps where we're not, we haven't got control of the management. And, and that's a fantastic way to work together, I think. Um, but if we didn't communicate often and make sure we all knew which were our priorities, then 
that wouldn't work. And I think what we'd end up doing, Lee, is probably going for similar funding pots or trying to do the same thing in the same area. Like if we weren't talking about water bowls each week, we would have tried to do it in one area, you'd try to do it in, in another. And who loses out? Well, it's the species, isn't it? So yeah, I think communication is key to, to partnership working and, and knowing what your goals are. Brilliant. Thanks for that, guys. OK, I've got another I've got another question here from Pete. Um, wanting to know a bit more about your nursery, Lee. Uh, yes, our tree nursery. So we've had a tree nursery at Horswater for several decades. I think it started in the 80s, um, but we've just recently had a DEFRA Green Recovery grant to expand it. Um, so because we've reduced the numbers of sheep at Horswater, we've ended up with quite a lot of redundant infrastructure. Uh, so like many farm steadings um, in the Lake District, you know, there is the original part of the steading, which was the stone farmhouse and perhaps a stone barn or two. But then as livestock numbers increased following the Second World War, lots of farmers put up uh, a steel frame portal building and then perhaps another one and then, then perhaps another one again. And that was a, a sign of just sort of how um, uh, sort of over exploited the landscape was sort of cast in, in steel and concrete, really. So we've en we ended up by, by sort of fitting our farming operation back into the landscape again, we've ended up with this infrastructure that wasn't really needed. So, so we've actually taken down one of those steel portal buildings and that's where we've built this new tree nursery. Um, it's just about finished. We're just about filling up the beds now with, with, um, with oak and holly and willow and rowan and hazel and everything that we, everything that we grow is collected from site, either sort of cuttings or, or seeds or whatever. Um, and that is going to provide us with the planting stock that we need for our habitat restoration work on site, but it should also provide us with a surplus that we can provide to other partners, perhaps also sell a little bit to, to, um, to, to the general public. Um, so as well as the trees, it's, it's growing the wildflowers from those crags as well. So, um, you know, globe flower and devil's bit scabious and alpine sawwort and, uh, you know, a really long list, actually. I think we've got what, sort of 30, 40 species in the nursery so far. Um, and again, those will be available, um, you know, for our for our conservation work as well as potentially for um, for uh, yeah income generation. So, and it's been really interesting since we've done it. Just how many other people have come to us saying, "Oh, we're thinking of doing something similar. Can we come and see what your setup is?" And one of the big risks that we've got, I think, face you know, everybody knows we need more trees in the landscape. Um, there is a big push from government to get them, but most of those trees are coming from supersized nurseries, quite often where the trees are genetic clones of each other. Um, so having a sort of dispersed network of smaller nurseries that are growing, you know, seed from different provenance, um, specialising in different species, I think is, is a really, really good thing. Absolutely. It sounds fascinating. And actually having it on site, that's, that's got to be good for sustainability as well. And only yep. using it is truly sort of growing local. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, properly. It doesn't get more local than that. <laughs> OK, I've got time for just one more question, and it's from Lindsay saying you mentioned that the red squirrel population you have and the possible benefits of pine martins. And she wanted to know, do you have any grey squirrels and do you control them now? Yeah, we do. We don't we don't get many. We're quite lucky um, because Horsewater is relatively isolated from other woodlands. Um, when we do get a few grey squirrels in, we can we can control them and um, and we don't tend to get a huge number coming in again. So. So we're really fortunate to have the Penrith um, red squirrel group that do the majority of the grey squirrel control for us. So we have lots of we do lots of monitoring. We, we we're the kind of the eyes on the ground and we tell them when a grey squirrel's seen and then they come in and they and they generally shoot them. Um, we we occasionally trap ourselves as well if the if the rangers are really busy working in other places. But we probably I don't know, maybe 10, 20 grey squirrels a year or something that that, that get killed. Um, and the red squirrel population is, is really thriving at Horswater as, as, as a result of that. That's really good to hear. Brilliant. And on that note, I'd like to say a big thank you to Lee for being our special guest tonight and also to Michael for sharing a bit of an insight into Eden Rivers Trust's work with partnerships. So thank you very much, both of you. It's been really, really fascinating. And if you've enjoyed the um, talk tonight, 
we have our next talk happening on the 17th of March at 6.30, which is called Creating a Stink About Pollution, where you can find out all about the work we've been doing in the media over the last few months around sort of sewage outflows in the area, the issues this causes, what it means for our rivers, and also the work we're doing and the work that you can do to help too. So we'd love to see you along for that one as well. So click on the QR code or hold your phone up to the your phone camera up at the QR code and please book on to the next talk in the series but for tonight I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us and have a lovely evening good night <laughs>